All right, you guys ready to rock and roll? Oh, I haven't been here so long, you all forgot the rules. Let me remind you of the rule. With me, I don't know how it is with Shannon and Jared, but with me, the better you respond, the earlier you get out. You know, that's very rude that you're clapping like that. It's very rude. You know how sensitive I am. I'm so sensitive. I'm, if you look up sensitive in a dictionary, probably my picture's there probably. Because you know how sensitive I am. All right? So yeah, that's the rule, because here's the deal, right? I'm a teacher. And if you don't respond to me, then I think you're not getting it. And if I think you're not getting it, I go into repeat mode. Because I want you to get it. All right, so here we go. John, the 15th chapter. Let's go back to verse uh, five. We began in this series last weekend. I mean, last Wednesday night. I love, love, love. It has, John 15 has always been, I, I, I think I would say John 15 and Romans 8 would be my favorite chapters in the Bible. John 15, beginning in verse 5, Jesus said, I, li listen to the words, listen to the words. I am the vine. You are the branches. Oh my gosh. You are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. All right. If, if we read that in the, you know, the New Testament was, was originally written in Greek. The word much there is the Greek word mega. So it's God's will that we bring forth mega fruit. All right, now look at this. Let's, let's continue reading, all right? Uh, verse six. If a man abides not in me, he's cast forth in a branch and is withered, and men gather them, cast them in the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear, here it is again, much fruit, read it out loud with me, so shall you be my disciples. So how many of you are a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ? So he's talking directly to us, right? So this is his will for us. Now, what is amazing to me, and I've read these verses, it's no telling how many times I've read them, all right? And every time I read them, to me, it paints an incredible picture of how powerful our connection to Jesus is, he abides in us. We abide in him. And because of that, we can and we should bear fruit in our lives. How many of you agree? And it's his will that we do it. All right, that this fruit is born. Now, we all know from practical living on the earth, and we all know that fruit is produced by what is inside the tree, not by what is on the outside of the tree or the, or the vine, but, but based on what is on the inside, right? No, no mystery there. And because of that, we know what certain trees are, not by what they look like, by the fruit that that tree bears. So the fruit tells us what's on the inside of the tree. Not on the outside, but what's on the inside produces the fruit, right? We all know that. So we know that in the natural, but we also know because in John, I mean, in Matthew 7, verse 16, in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, you shall know them or know men by their fruits. You shall know men by their fruits. So we know what a person is really like by their fruit. Not by how they look or even sound, but by the fruit that their lives bear. 
Now we've all know from practical experience that oftentimes things look a certain way on the outside, but then we discover from the fruit that they're not what we thought they were. Right? We also know from the scripture, right? Because Eve said that she looked on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and said that it was pleasing to the eye. It was a tree to be desired. And she took the fruit and did eat. And what she thought was going to do her good actually brought, brought her death. So because it looked good on the outside, the fruit produced death. Now we know that even in the natural world, right? My grandchildren were at my house last night and they wanted me to cut up a lemon for them. And, you know, I was, I just finished this lesson. So I was thinking about it, right? I mean, lemons are great to look at. The color's appealing. They smell wonderful. I, I think they do. I think they smell incredible. And I guess a lot of people do because there's all kinds of things you can buy at the store that are lemon scented. All right. So we like them. But for most of us, now there's a few of you in here, but most of us are not going to grab a lemon and bite into it. Why? Because even though it looks good on the outside and the tree looks pretty good, the insides are not that good. Fine with lemons, fine with other things, but we're talking about even more important things. All right? So we know, let's, let's continue reading in Matthew 7. Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. All right? Let's continue. Verse 18. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. 19. Every tree that does not bear good fruit, Jesus said, is cut down and thrown into the fire. Pastor, I don't want to be thrown in the fire. Then bear good fruit. <laughs> Therefore, by their fruits, what? You will know them. You will know them. All right, I hadn't planned on saying this, but every time I read these verses, I feel that I'm compelled to have to say this. So I can save some of you some real heartbreak. I don't care how good he looks in his jeans. I don't care how good he smells. I don't care how good he kisses. If he treats you bad, step away from the curb. Amen. And the same thing's true for the other gender. I don't care how good she smells. I don't care how good she looks. I don't care how good she looks in her jeans. I don't care how good she kisses. If she treats you bad, know her by her fruit. Amen. Quit telling yourself that lemon tree is an apple tree. Okay, back to the point, Charles. Thank you. So what, what let, let me repeat again to you tonight, all right, before we get in to what I want to share with you tonight. So what is on the inside clearly determines, based on these verses we've just read, so what is on the inside clearly determines the quality of the fruit. We know something can, as I said, can look good and not be good. We, if we don't know this, we should know this. Character in a man or woman's life is greater than gifting. Amen. It's more important than gifting. There's a history is full, right, of stories of gifted men and women who failed. So it's not gifting, it's character. Right? It's what's on the inside. Its integrity is greater than appearance. Could I hear a good amen if you agree with that, right? Here's a fact. Simple, but it's a fact. Fruit never lies as to what is on the inside of the tree. 
never lies, cannot lie, because the fruit is produced by what's on the inside of the tree. All right? So go with me now to Galatians, the fifth chapter. And the Bible talks about fruit, and we're going to look at some specific fruit. Tonight, next couple of weeks, we're going to look at some specific fruit that God has made it possible for each of us to bear and to be seen in our lives. Right? Men know we are his disciples because of the fruit that our lives bear. Can I hear a good amen on that, right? Been going kind of slow and methodical, but let's kick it into high gear, okay? So men know the fruit. They know that we are his disciples because of the fruit we bear. They don't know I'm a disciple of Christ because of a bumper sticker or because I wear something around my neck or because I have a 14-pound Bible that I beat people over the head with. All right? They don't even know I'm a disciple because I leave my house every Sunday early. All right? As far as some of my neighbors go, they may think I have an early golf game or an early tennis game for all they know. All right? People know that we are his disciples because of the fruit that our lives bear. Can I hear a good amen tonight? Right? Do we all agree with that? Right? We read it. Jesus said it. End of discussion. Let me rephrase that. Jesus said it, we read it, end of discussion. <laughs> okay? And so it's the fruit. Now, there's different kinds of fruit, but this is fruit that he is specifically instructed that, they, that he wants us to bear here in Galatians 5. And it starts off in verse 22, and it's called the fruit of the Spirit. And he's going to list nine different kinds of fruit that our lives can bear and should bear. And let me say, I don't think you should think that you're going to be bearing all of this fruit every day of your life because these fruits are for different circumstances or situations that you may find yourself in. Does that make sense to you? Okay. And so there's moments for each of them. And you may in the course of a day or in the course of a week bear all nine of them. But I'm saying that to you because when I first started reading this decades ago, I was trying to produce all of it all at the same time. And I got exhausted. Okay, because I had a hard time keeping track of all of them. Right, and then I, over time, I discovered that they're for different moments, different circumstances, different situations that are in my life. Now, he calls them the fruit of the Spirit. Now, I notice there in the, in the Scripture, right, the translators capitalize the word Spirit. And they, it's all right that they did, but it's, it's important that I point this out to you. This is not something the Holy Spirit does through us without our participation. All right, the Holy Spirit has brought this capability to you as a child of God, but you and I choose to bear these fruits. We make them important to us. Okay, let me say it to you this way. What they, what, what, one way that has helped me is they are really character traits, all right, that we choose to exhibit in our life, and they are in us, because 2 Peter 1, 4 says we are partakers of God's divine nature because we are born of God and God has put them in us to bear through our lives, to bless us, to bless others, to make the world a better place, to make our families better, and to present this fruit to the world as the sign that I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I am a child of God and I am a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And these fruits are being born in my life. So, you know, I, I tell people all the time, you know, people may argue with you over scripture, but they can't argue over two things. Number one, they can't argue over your personal 
interaction with the Lord and what the Lord has done for you, unless they just look at you and call you a liar, well then conversation kind of ends there, doesn't it? Or number two, right? They can't argue with the fruit. Now they may call me an apple tree, but there's clearly oranges on my branches. So clearly I'm an orange. Right? Does that all make sense to you? Now I can bear these fruits. You can bear these fruits. But you have to want to. You got to focus on it. You have to desire it in your life. Because you are a disciple. Amen. Amen. And it becomes important to you. That he's in me. I'm in him. He's the vine. I'm a branch. Jesus bears these kind of fruits. I want to bear them too because I'm connected to him. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right, let's break them down, right? There's nine of them. Let's read them all, right? He said, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering or self-discipline, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and he says, against such there is no law. Or in other words, there's nothing that can stop you from bearing this fruit. Nothing can stop you from bearing this fruit. And there is no law greater than the power of these fruits being born in and through your life. Okay, so let's go back to verse 22. All right, so let's break it down. Let's look at the first one. But the fruit of the Spirit is... Love. It's not a coincidence love is listed first, right? I don't think it is, right? Because there abides these three, right? Faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. All right? So let me give you some definitions. How many of you knew they were coming? Okay. Well, let me back up. Before we break this down, I've got a statement here that I think is really important. So all of these nine fruits, as I said to you, are... A good way to look at them as they are, they are character traits. So here's a fact. Aren't a lot of humanity's problems and a lot of humanity's greatness defined by and traceable to character traits that humanity exhibits? Yeah, amen. Amen. A lot of humanity's problems are because of certain character traits or, to be scriptural, bad fruit that humans exhibit. And a lot of humanity's greatness is because of character traits that those humans exhibited and chose to bring forth in their life. And they come out of our character traits. How many of you would say amen to that, right? So I believe that it's since, can, can I take a leap here? I believe that you're here on a Wednesday night, right? The NBA playoffs are on. You decided to come to church. You're here. You drove here. You invested 30 minutes getting here, 30 minutes going home. You got here early. You put your kids in the, in the depositories back over there. All right, wherever they are. <laughs> Right, you stopped at the uh, at the uh, coffee shop. Maybe picks up something. Maybe some of you came without even any eating dinner. Right, you're here. You've got another when the service is over, a good 15 minutes to get off the property. Another 30 minutes to drive home. Is it safe for me when I look at all that evidence, all that fruit? I am assuming that you want to be great in life. And because I make that assumption based upon the fruit that I see hanging on their branches, that's why I talk to you the way I talk to you. Because I'm assuming you don't want a mediocre, barely get by. You want to live a great life. Amen. Amen? And great life requires great decisions and great understanding. All right, so we are all, we are the children of God. And because we are the children of God, we're able to bear 
all of these fruits because we are a part of the vine. Is there any doubt Jesus has all nine of these in him? Yeah, they're all in him. Well, if they're in him, then he wants them to flow through you because you're attached to the vine. Amen? So let's look at it, right? The word fruit there in the Greek text means, this is really important, the result or the effect. These fruits come out of our born again spirits. They come out of our born again spirits. They are not flesh generated. They don't come out of our minds. They come out of our spirit men, born again spirit. They are the result of us choosing to live with, hear this now, they are the result of us choosing to live with and to live from a spiritual perspective. Now, I don't mean spiritual the way they use it on television. Well, I'm a very spiritual person. <sighs> I shouldn't make fun of that. I'm sorry. All right, I'm not going to do it anymore. But we, God wants us to live from a spiritual perspective or out of our hearts and not out of our flesh. Because earlier in the chapter, and we'll probably come back to this in a couple of weeks and look at those, he talks about the lusts of the flesh. And those are not fun. You don't want to be with somebody that lives out of their flesh. Ugh. Okay, so let's, let's get, jump into this. All right, here's the first one, right? Love. So here's some definitions as this word is used in this chapter. Okay, it means goodwill towards others. Good will towards others. Woohoo! If I could give America a vaccine tonight, I would give them a vaccine of goodwill towards others. I would hook America up to a drip tonight, one in each arm and probably one in your leg too, right? Because what this country needs is some good will towards others. And we're not seeing it, right? We're not seeing it. I mean, I'm not saying it's gone away. There's still people that have it. But on social media, you don't see a lot of good will. You see some, right? You see some, okay? I mean, my, my grandkids were at a play place uh, yesterday with the kids thing. They went on the kids thing. And, she, and Emery was telling me last night that they were, on, they were in this place and there was an indoor basketball court. And, you know, my, my granddaughter's 11. 11. And she said these, like, 15, 16-year-old boys came on the court and, uh, and they were, like, and they walked up to them and said, get the out of here. Wow, man, those parents are doing an incredible job of raising these potential thugs. You've got to be so proud that your 15-year-old talks to an 11-year-old using that word. My 11-year-old looked at the 15-year-old and said, wow, you sure are mature. Around and walked away. So you know them by their fruit. So let us not underestimate the power of love as defined by goodwill toward others. Can I hear a good amen tonight? Amen. We sitting in this room tonight, there's probably 1,500 of you or more in this service tonight. All right, maybe more, maybe closer to 2,000. Imagine the impact that we could have, the tidal wave that we could start, if it's not already started, and keep it going if all of us made the decision, as for me, I'm going to exhibit the fruit of love in my life, and I'm going to have goodwill towards others. And I'm going to teach my kids the same thing. I'm going to teach my grandkids the same thing. 
All right, let's continue. Goodwill towards others. It also means the love of our neighbor. It means benevolence, right? Which is another word for being generous. Okay, being benevolent, being generous. All right, it also means brotherly affection. So Jesus commands us to have this in our lives. I got a bunch of verses with you. Look at John 15, 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you love one another as I've loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. All right, go with me to another verse. John 17, I've declared to them your name. Jesus, this is Jesus praying right before he's arrested. And we'll declare it, that they may love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. So the same love that he loves us, that the father loved him, he said he's put that love in us. My gosh. Amen. 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 Incredible. Romans 12, 10. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. The impact of this is phenomenal. All right, look at 1 John 4. Beloved, beloved, let us love one another for love is of God. And everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. It's a sign that we know God because we have goodwill towards others, because we exhibit love towards others, because we're generous towards other people. Amen. Can I challenge all of us in this room tonight not to allow the critical, ugly, rude, mean part of our world to suck us into it? Well, Pastor, everybody's that way. Well, that doesn't mean I have to be that way. It doesn't mean you have to be that way. It doesn't mean we have to get sucked into that, right? Into that, into that cesspool. You know, just because somebody's living in a sewer doesn't mean I'm going to go down there and live with them. Amen. Amen. All right. I, I wrote this in my notes. Love gives us a higher life. How many of you believe that? Amen. It gives us a higher life. It takes us up to another level of living. It makes us more godlike because God is love makes us more godlike amen number 2 the second fruit elicited was joy joy all right this this is a fruit that i i think for much of my life i was just kind of waiting around for it where's the joy cuz joy did not come natural to me all right, so let me give you some definitions. Are you glad you came tonight? Joy means gladness of heart, gladness of heart. It means happiness that is caused by something good. Well, it's not that mysterious, is it? Happiness that is caused by something good. You know, I was, I was talking to a fellow the other day, and he was helping me kind of sort some things out in my life, and... and um, so I was talking to him, he's a really bright guy, and he works with some NBA teams and, and professional athletes, and he used to work with fighter pilots uh, in the Air Force and in the Navy, and he's really a bright guy, and so I, was, I got access to him, and I was talking to him about some things, and, and uh, he said, so how would, you, how would you describe your life? And I said, well, you know, can, okay, I'm, I've already opened it up, I gotta tell you now, right? I said, well, to be honest with you, I said, why do we start phrases with to be honest with you? Does that mean up until that moment we've been lying, right? <laughs> I'm going to cut that out of my life too, <laughs> to be honest with you. No, so anyway, <laughs> I was, don't clap. That was too easy. All right. And so I said to him, I said, I said, you know, the way I kind of look at my life right now, maybe, maybe some of you can associate with this. As part of my life, several areas of my life are like the Garden of Eden. And then I have other areas of my life that are like a desert. 
He said, oh, I'm going to use that. And I said, well, I didn't give it to you. I didn't say it for you to use it, but you're welcome to use it. I said, I'm just telling you, that's how I feel kind of sometimes in my life. I have a Garden of Eden and have a desert. I said, now, because I'm a child of God, I know the book of Isaiah, and I'm standing on God's promise that he's going to bring a river into my desert. Amen. All right? So what does that have to do with joy? If you're not careful... I know in my life, I, I've had to change this in my life, maybe this will help you. I have a tendency, I, I was raised with this tendency in my life to just always look at the desert and never be happy about the garden. Or to downplay the occasions to be happy because something good has happened in your life. We live in a society that is so competitive and so comparative. And it's tragic. I know you know this, but let me just remind you again tonight, a huge part of what you see on Instagram and all that is fake. It's staged. It's not real. It's fake. These people that are living these 100% wonderful lives, it's fake. It's staged. And it's creating a false expectancy in you and in your kids. Nobody is totally happy every day in every circumstance. But there are things that come into our lives that we can be happy about and that will create joy in our lives. Am I being too practical for you tonight? All right, and I've had to train myself over the years to purposefully look at that stuff. Now it's easy for me. Now I, I look for that. Now I enjoy that. Now I, I look for that, and I live my life. Some of you have heard me say this, and it was, I wasn't this way to begin with, but maybe it'll help you. I live my life aggressively thankful and grateful for all of the good that is in my life. And at the same time, there are things I wish were better. I'm standing in front of you tonight telling you there's some areas of my life right now. I want to get better. But it doesn't change that there are other parts of my life that are great. And I'm going to be happy for that and be praying about this. Amen? And that's what produces joy. Gladness of heart. So we all have occasions to be joyful. Amen? 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 Amen. It's not just when you get that new purse or when you get that new truck. Or the, I, Listen, I, I want you to be happy when you get those things. Good for you. But it's also the fact, you know, you know I, I think this way. I do. Maybe it'll help you. You know, I'm grateful that every morning I get up, I can drink the water that comes out of my tap. I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful there's people down there at the water treatment plant that are making sure all of that happens. I'm grateful they're there. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. I'm grateful that when I lay in bed at night, I hear the helicopters going over my house and I see the spotlights going around because somebody's watching out for me and my family. I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful that somebody keeps the traffic lights synchronized and working. I'm grateful that when I flush the toilet, it works. I'm grateful for all of that. I'm grateful. I'm grateful that people work at the airlines and the air traffic controllers. And I'm grateful for all that. Do I have to keep going on? I'm grateful that when I go to the grocery store, I've been to the grocery stores in third world countries. It's not what you see. You really go, Pastor? Yeah, I go. I've been to many of them. I've had people take me into them because I want to see them. I've been in places where there's a sign in the hotel and I'm standing in a nice hotel. Do not drink this water. Right there, right above the faucet. They tell you when you take a shower to hold your breath. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You've been there. So let's allow ourselves to be happy. Amen. 
Amen. Right? People say, why are you so happy? Ooh, I'm so glad you asked. Hmm? We have joy, and we should have joy. Joy from seeing, with, seeing when the Lord blesses us, when the Lord answers our prayers, when we hear his word. Nehemiah 8.10 says, when you hear the word, it brings joy to your life, and that joy gives your life strength. Amen. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And it comes from hearing the word. That's the context of the chapter. I've got to get done, right? So here's the last one, peace. This is a whole teaching in itself on peace. Jared wrote a book about it. It's that big. So I, in this last couple of minutes, I'm going to give you all the definitions. You ready? It is a state of conscious reconciliation with God. So it is a state of conscious. So I... I, I I think about it. I accept it that I, you have been reconciled to God. I didn't have to do anything to make that happen, but admit my need for Jesus Christ and ask him to come into my life. Whew. And I can't lose it. It is a state of conscious reconciliation with God and all the blessings that accompany and flow from that reconciliation. So I'm not only saved, I have blessings coming. Amen. This God that reconciled me just keeps pouring it on. Wow. It does not come. Please get this. Because we see a lot of this springing up in our world today. This peace does not come as the result of indifference or apathy or selfish non-disturbance as, as practiced by some in our world today. Well, I'm going to have peace because I just don't care. Don't talk to me about it. I don't want to hear about it. Right? Right? Don't talk to me about that. Don't talk to me about the poor. Don't talk to me about kids being abused. Don't talk to me about people being sold into slavery. Don't talk to me about, I don't want to hear about it because I got to keep my peace. You have fake. You're fake. It's fake. You have fake. I'm sorry. Somebody's got to tell you the truth. I told you the truth. There you go. All right. You also know that peace means health, welfare, prosperity, and every kind of good. It is the absence of confusion. God, I love that definition. It is the state of a soul assured of its salvation through Jesus. God's peace is, ne God's peace is never identified with selfish, unconcern, listen, and is independent of outside conditions. Philippians 4, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your heart and mind through Jesus Christ. So there is a peace that is not produced by the circumstances you're living in. Wow. Wow. Hmm? Some of you know, you've lived it. Amen. Are you glad you came to church tonight? So you can have this peace. I'm convinced. Okay, this is the last thought. I wrote this down. The more we grow in our understanding of our salvation, that he is the vine, we are the branches, the more we will grow in the fruit of peace. The more I understand my salvation, the more peace I will have in my life. Stand your feet with me, please. Give you a lot of homework to go home and study. Let's pray over it. Lift your hands towards heaven with me. I'm going to lead you into confession. If you agree with me, say it. All right, you'll hear the words first. Lord Jesus, I thank you tonight. You are my vine. I am your branch. I'm connected to you. And the life that's in you is flowing in me. I need to grow in that understanding. Please help me to understand that and help me to grow in understanding 
that you have reconciled me to you. I am a saved child of God. I'm not afraid of losing my salvation. You called me. You brought me in. And now your life, it can flow through me. I open the gates. I want your fruit to flow through me. Love, joy, and peace. I choose them to describe my life and who I am as a disciple in Jesus' name, amen. Can I have every head bowed, please, for just a moment? Just a moment. I want to give you the opportunity tonight, if you have not done so, I've talked a lot about it tonight, and I want to give you the opportunity tonight to become a child of God. This is your opportunity to receive Jesus into your life, to accept him and be reconciled to God, to have all of your sins forgiving, forgiven and to be put in a position where the blessings of God are flowing into your life. You re I read you the definition tonight. It comes out of the original language. That's exactly what God desires, to reconcile you and then to pour out his blessings on your life. It is a package deal, right? It's like if you get the water, you get the wet. If you accept you receive your reconciliation through faith in Jesus Christ. Then the blessings begin to flow in your life. God wants you to have it. You know, years ago I said that and I had a guy come up to me after the service and say, well, I didn't get saved to be blessed. Well, I didn't either, but the blessings come. Hmm? That's like saying, you know, I, I wanted the water, but I didn't want, get, want the wet. Well, if you get the water, you get the wet. Amen. If you get the oxygen, you get the life. Amen. So I want to give you that opportunity tonight to become a child of God. In a moment, I'm going to lead the whole church into prayer. On the floor, in the risers, online. If you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, I'm going to ask you to pray along with us tonight. If you've never asked him to come into your heart and received him as your Lord and your Savior, I'm going to ask you to pray along with us tonight. If you'd say to me tonight, Pastor, I'm not sure what I need. I just feel like I'm not connected to God the way I should be, then pray with us tonight. This is how you get connected to God. Jesus is the way to the Father. He brings us to the Father. So if you'd say to me tonight, Charles, I'm going to pray with you tonight. When everyone prays, I'm going to pray. This is my night on the floor, in the risers, online. If that's you, before we pray, would you do me a favor? Pastor, I'm going to pray with you. Put your hand up right now. It encourages me to see your hands. Raise your hand up. Keep it up for just a moment. Our ushers are going to come and give you a little self-explanatory card. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. The ushers are moving towards people in the risers. Thank you. Here on the floor, Pastor, I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to make Jesus Lord of my life tonight. All right, all of you raise your hands and everyone else pray out loud. Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I receive you tonight into my life as my Lord and Savior. I believe you died and rose again to give me life, forgiveness for all my sins, and to bring me reconciliation with God through you. Come live in me. Live in me. I believe I am now a branch attached to you, the vine. Flow through me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Can we rejoice with these people tonight? If you prayed that prayer, scan that QR code or scan the one on your car. All right, love you all. God bless. Who's going to be in church with me this coming Sunday? All right, I'm not supposed to tell you where, where, where we're going to be, but I'm going to be here, so I'm going to be looking for you on Father's Day. Amen. Thank you.